We are familiar with the image of an oasis in the Sahara Desert, of date palms and camels. But we are not in the Sahara. We're in the red centre of Australia where there are many oases. Fringed with lush palms, these spring-fed waters harbour a wonderful variety of marine life. In this relic of a wetter past, an echo of an ancient rainforest long since vanished, there's a wealth of animal life around the oasis. Our oasis is a Garden of Eden in an arid land, surrounded by red cliffs and a lush foliage of red cabbage palms, survivors of a wetter era. It's a permanent waterhole, fed by an underground spring that may have lain beneath the desert for a thousand years before bubbling up to give life to the oasis. Dragonflies always seem to be mating. Three pairs line up on one branch. The blue-coloured male grips the female's head with his terminal abdominal claspers. There's competition for the best perch over the water to copulate. This infringement of privacy must be very annoying. The interrupted pair choose another perch. Now the female slips underwater and bends her abdomen forward to receive his sperm from a special copulatory organ which lies at the front of his abdomen. An annoying competitor forces him underwater too while the female is laying her fertilised eggs. Either she is good at holding her breath or she's drowning. Life sparkles on the surface. Aptly named whirligig beetles spend their entire life rushing around in erratic circles. The water glider uses surface tension to actually walk on top of the water. Quite amazing. A hidden pond dweller beats its rhythm of life. When a praying mantis loses its perch, it falls victim to a pond predator. Now this is a big tadpole. It metamorphoses into a prince of the lily pad. Delicacy of the oasis, the red-clawed crayfish must hide in the algae. The olive python's forked tongue tastes the air for animal sense. It can smell one on the other side of the oasis pool. When it comes closer, heat-sensitive pits along the upper jaw detect the body heat of its prey.
Ben Crop will see what's down below. It's freezing, absolutely freezing. Must be five or ten degrees, and I'm used to 30. The mirror surface reflects the lush palms above. Only my shivering from the penetrating cold reminds me I'm down here in another world. The red-clawed crayfish and I meet head-on. It thinks I'm a predator. Maybe so. I wouldn't mind eating it. This artesian spring provides fish with a constant flow of water at the same temperature and chemistry. The most common fish I see is the rainbow fish, a natural predator of mosquito larvae. Its predators are the turtles and eels. How alien the turtle looks. It lives in two worlds. Ben's dive is short. He's as blue as his wetsuit from the cold. Another land creature who doesn't mind the cold is the water monitor. It's a large, semi-aquatic goanna and when underwater, it will tuck its legs in and undulate its body and oar-shaped tail into a swimming motion. Its target is a rainbow fish. Up to 40 lizard species live around this oasis, the highest recorded lizard diversity of any habitat around the world. They are successful because they're cold-blooded, and do not have to maintain a constant body temperature in this area of extreme heat and cold. Summer temperatures reach 40 degrees Celsius and can plummet to minus seven on a winter night. It's no shock to a monitor to bask in 40 degrees on land and then plunge into 10 degree water. The water monitor reflects the two worlds of the oasis. 
It can prey on the fish below and the marsupials above. Have we slipped back in time to the Jurassic period? The dawn mist rises as the winter nights grow colder. The oasis is deep in the red centre at Australia's point of inaccessibility. That's the point on the mainland, farthest from the coast. The rust-red cliffs are home to the yellow-footed rock wallaby, an endangered species, it's small enough to be prey for the desert carnivores. The Parenti, Australia's largest lizard and the second largest in the world, is a potential threat. This one is two metres long, only the Komodo dragon of Indonesia is bigger. The flicking tongue is a sensor, tasting the air for a meal. It smells an easier prey, a rock rat cooling off in the oasis pool. The rat has swallowed awfully fast. Bearded dragons are also on its menu. The lighter patches on the hexagonal shaped blotches are where it's beginning to shed its skin. No desert oasis would be without its most handsome visitor, the red kangaroo. Lord of the open plains, it never ranges far from shade and water. Long legs walk the shallows of the oasis looking for their kind of food. Web-footed ducks go bottom up and plummet down for their meal. High in a dead tree, two nesting eagles have a panoramic view of the rainbow fish in the oasis below.
It misses and tries again. Black Kite hovers above the oasis, waiting for a dragonfly to lift up so it can swoop and catch it in mid-air. The wedge-tailed eagle is Australia's largest bird of prey with a wingspan more than two metres. Two eggs are close to hatching in its nest. The eyes of this hunter detect the movement of a small animal from a great height. The oasis was once dominated by giant marsupials and ferocious carnivores of an ancient time. The giant kangaroo was a meat eater and it became extinct not so long ago, for an Aborigine drew it on a cave wall, showing a jaw full of sharp teeth. The oasis waterhole was represented by a rock engraving of concentric circles. The oasis is a sort of Jurassic Park with meaning. Here one is confronted by the enormous shadow of Australia's ancient past, where nature offers visions of its truth. The Aborigines have been here for 22,000 years. The oasis supplied all of their primitive needs. Where its spring waters trickle into the desert sands, a host of desert creatures survive. A mole cricket crosses the sand in safety, underground. Bearded dragons are characterised by a broad triangular head and a flat body. The throat has a well-developed pouch or beard, sporting a border of long, spiny scales. A female attracts the amorous interests of two males, but three's a crowd in this desert encounter. The winner is now alone with the female. He raises his front paw in a pantomime gesture that means in lizard language, I'm coming to get you. He's a little rough at it. The tiger beetle is a voracious predator of field cockroaches. An emu and a black-breasted buzzard are players in an amazing drama beside the oasis. When she walks away and leaves her eggs unguarded, that's the cue for the buzzard to fly in. He's understandably cautious at first, for an angry emu mother could demolish him.
He uses the rock as a tool to break open an egg. He hits his own foot. The close presence of the emu distracts him. The highly venomous death adder is a nocturnal predator. It's looking for a good place to settle into an ambush before the night falls. The largest of skinks, the blue-tongued lizard, feeds on field cockroaches. It rocks as it walks. The thorny devil's horns are not sharp. It's only dangerous to the thousand ants it swallows in one meal. The devil is one creature who shuns the oasis. Its body has only to touch a dew-covered bush and the moisture is drawn along grooves in its thorny skin to its mouth. The splendor of sunset colors the oasis and the nocturnal creatures stir. Only the death adder lies still and waits. Some desert marsupials are now extinct. Others, like the cute canary, are endangered, vulnerable to feral animals and habitat destruction. The bilby is endangered, its habitat disturbed. They once were spread over 70% of Australia, now that shrunk to 15%. The extreme rare stick nest rat builds its nest but not its future. To attract a mouse, the death adder wriggles its tail to mimic a worm and draws the victim closer. The contractions of the body, called peristalsis, moves the victim down. A winter dawn plummets the temperature to minus seven. The larger fish of the oasis are gasping to breathe. In a natural phenomenon, Protozoan proliferates in the cold water and multiplies on the fish's gills. This reduces the efficiency of the fish to extract oxygen from the water and slowly they suffocate. In just one cold morning, all the large fish of the oasis die. The cleanup is a job for the eagles. A bearded dragon is frozen and cannot move.
Even the parenti will not feed when the temperature is too cold. The rock rat is either aware of this or just lucky. A desert spade foot toad burrows down and will remain insulated from the world above for many months until the rains come. We leave our cold oasis in the desert and move further north to another spring-fed oasis. Here the thermal pool is so much warmer, a constant 32 degrees Celsius. The water sparkles in clarity, the visibility underwater over 30 metres, and Lynn Roberts welcomes this pleasant change. The oasis has its own serpents, fortunately harmless to Lynn. The carpet snake protectively coils around her clutch of eggs. The file snake lives a life underwater, periodically rising for air like a sea snake. It's so named for its coarse, rasp-like skin. Here is where the underwater spring bubbles up into our world at the rate of 30 million litres per day. Pig-nosed turtles thrive in this constant stream of warm water. Large animals sometimes tumble in and drown. This bone probably belongs to a cow. Ben and Lynn saw many bones and believe this oasis may hold a storehouse of fossil finds. Whiskered catfish probe the sediment in search of food.
Water lily pads shelter creatures below and provide a wobbly platform above for a bird that walks on water. Long, stick-like feet give the comb-crested jacana a delicate balance. She is guarding her three eggs, laid in the most precarious position. While the lily pads hide the lurking catfish below, they also hide a view of the eggs above. Catfish will eat anything. Even a wounded comrade, they follow and nibble while still alive. As the day draws to a close, the pool darkens and the palm trees are tinged with fire. Around its perimeter, there's a changing of the guard. New creatures stir. When the sugar glider runs out of food on this tree, it spreads wing-like membranes and glides to another tree. That sure saves a lot of climbing down and up. Aren't they cute? A brush-tailed possum and its baby. A tree kangaroo does a gymnast's feet on a limb to nibble at leaves. The oasis waters cascade over a fossil tufa wall and spill into the headwaters of a river. Here, the wildlife changes dramatically. It's eerie diving in these dark waters. I know there's little here that can really hurt me but my vision is so restricted, I bump into obstacles. There's a barramundi, a big guy, hidden in the branches. He's definitely after the frog. is a barra's favourite meal. A giant cherubin prawn. Lynn was hesitant to join me. She feels better protected in a wetsuit. The fish life are typical river species, like this sooty grunter. fish with bold black spots cruises just beneath the surface. It shoots a jet of water and knocks an insect down. The archer fish can shoot the jet of water by a sudden contraction of its gills, which forces the water through a tube formed by the tongue and a groove in the mouth. The accuracy of its aim is remarkable, for the archer fish must allow for the angle of refraction where the water meets the air. In the dawn mist, a dingo was on the prowl. 
it's brought down a wallaby. The forked tongue of the Gould's goanna combines with a special sensor called a Jacobson's organ that detects the most minute trails of scent in the prey. A large frill lays folded around the neck of the frill-necked lizard. It's only raised when alarmed. Down by the riverbank, a butcher bird catches a locust. The jacana eggs have now hatched and three little babies scamper across the lily pads in the oasis. Other birds feed in the swampland that borders both the oasis and the little river it created. A male heron is over-enthusiastic in its courting display. However, it comes back from its dunking to continue chasing the female. A male brolga does all the digging and when he uncovers a worm, his partner kindly takes it from him. They mate for life and trumpet their happiness to the sky. Darters are divers and need to hang out their wings to dry. A juvenile pied heron is light enough to be able to walk the lily pads like the jacana. The oasis and its swampy surroundings is a prolific feeding and breeding ground. The bountiful fish life attracts all kinds of birds. In the morning calm, there's not a breath of wind to ruffle the surface and spoil the mirror image of a tranquil pool. High in a tree, a nesting darter tries to appease two hungry chicks. She must dive for their supper. This data has a big problem. There's a freshwater crocodile below.
The crocodile seems more interested in lapping up the sun than having data for dinner. Freshwater crocodiles dominate the marine life in the river headwaters beside the oasis. They grow to a length of three meters and can live for 50 years. Ben and Lynn are not at risk filming them underwater for they are not people eaters. But freshwater crocs can deliver a sizable bite. The long slender jaw contains many needle sharp teeth which grasp the prey firmly. It's now September, and as the waters darken and the light fades, a primal instinct draws the female croc to the riverbank. She lays a dozen eggs in a hole she excavated in the sand. When covered up, they will incubate for the next 10 weeks. Only 30% of the eggs will make it to the hatching stage. Goannas see to that. A wall of rocks and rapids makes the headwaters inaccessible to the marine creatures that live downstream. Thank goodness this stops the dangerous saltwater crocodile from moving any further upstream. Can you imagine the damage it could do to upset the delicate balance of nature around the oasis? Pile snakes also live here. The oasis mirrors storm clouds moving in. The monsoonal wet begins. Only two of the Jacana chicks have survived. A freshwater croc took one for sure. The dingo has a new litter. Freshwater crocodiles time their hatchlings to emerge at the start of the wet, so they enter this world at a time of plenty.
those buried deeper down instinctively struggle upwards. Born ready to bite, the youngsters have their first fight. Instinct quickly teaches them to swim. Mortality is high. 90% will die in the first year, falling prey to birds and barramundi. Monsoon rains are heavy now, and floodwaters rise and spread. The flooding submerges the protective rock bar and a saltwater crocodile makes it upstream. The animal population remain unaware of the impending danger. They've lived a life without stress from big predators. Palms and tufa wall barricade the croc from reaching the spring waters of the oasis. In the desert oasis, the monsoon rains are a trickle at first. The tiger beetle does not pause in demolishing cockroaches. and a painted dragon opens its mouth to catch the sweet rain. The rain is heavier now. It seeps down into the red earth and awakens a dormant body that has slept for six months. It's the spade-foot toad come back to this world. Close by are termites to satisfy its hunger. Its back legs are twitching uncontrollably because it's so excited at seeing food. Flooding in the desert creates a dramatic change. The oasis waters turn blood red. 
A wave of life is set in motion by the rains. A wormer python waits beside an egg that hatches. The touch of water awakens new life everywhere and wildflowers bloom and paint the desert in a blaze of colour. The rain seeps deep below the desert and adds to the reserve that eternally bubbles up and gives life and lushness to all the wonderful inhabitants of the oasis.